Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing about connective tissue and related disorders which are related to connective tissue. Connective tissue as we all know is the most abundant tissue in our human body which act as a supporting tissue for uh, the cells or the tissue or other, other organs to exist. The most uh, component of connective tissues are collagen, elastin, and mucopolysaccharidosis, saccharides, glycoproteins, and few cells which are present in extracellular matrix that is mast cell. Uh, for an example, you can you, you can see there are collagen fibers which are there. Then there are fibroblast, mast cells, lymphocytes. These are all constitute a eh, connective tissue. So extracellular matrix. What exactly the extracellular matrix contain? Extracellular matrix important molecules which are present are collagen, elastin, proteoglycan, and structural glycoproteins. In uh, proteoglycan, they are basically heteropolysaccharide. We will discuss them separately. And the glycoprotein, which are structural glycoproteins, are fibronectin and lamin. Then collagen is the most uh, important uh, component of extracellular matrix. There are many types of collagen depending on their distribution in the tissue. They are type 1 collagen, which is present in the skin, tendon, muscle, and wall of blood vessels, the most uh, commonly affected. Uh, Collagen type is type 1. Type 2, they are present in vertebral disc and hyaline. Type 3, they are found in spleen, muscle, and iota. Type 4, they are found in different basement. This you have to remember basement membrane and muscle. So, the kidney, glomerular basement membrane, we found, we find collagen type 4, glomerular basement membrane, glomerulus. Type 5, it is an embryonic collagen, embryonic cell cultures and type 6 is found in muscles and skin. So, remember type 1, type 4 and type 3, which are most commonly asked then coming to the collagen structures, I already described a little bit in earlier classes what is collagen and what is the effect of collagen, vitamin C on collagen. Collagen are triple helix. Collagen are triple helix. They are wound around themselves, wound around themselves. So, here you can see the primary structure of collagen which is individual fibril. Most prominent among them you observe uh, the amino acids which are most prominent are glycine, proline, lysine and the proline and lysine are modified into hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine. So, the majority of the amino acids which are present in collagen are contributed from glycine, proline and lysine. And glycine is present at the bend of the helix. If there is an helix formation being a small molecule, it can be accumulated by the curves. So, glycine molecule is always present at the curves and also every third molecule is glycine in collagen tissue and proline also accommodate proline and lysine accommodate for one sixth of the amino acid present in the glycine. Apart from the protein we have glucose and galactose in the collagen structure. This 
galactose attachment of glucose and galactose gives the collagen its uh, other name proteoglycan means it is a protein but it is attached with the carbohydrate molecule then collagen has higher amount of uh, glycine hydroxyproline and lysine and many amino acids are missing because they are more uh, with glycine proline and hydroxyproline and lysine in this structure and it is a triple lx oriented three chains are twisted around each other to form a fibril and the hydrogen bonds bind together this lx this is a hydrogen bond here it is binding the lx see you can see at the curvature the glycine is present every third amino acid is glycine and you have proline and hydroxyproline also proline hydroxyproline are also more abundantly seen in collagen molecule so coming to the organization protein organization i have taken the collagen as an example to describe the protein organization structure they are few they have few mcqs based on protein organization structure you should know what is primary structure primary sequence or primary structure sequence secondary six structures tertiary and quaternary so primary means amino acid sequence so a particular amino acid sequence which is specific for the collagen or specific for that particular protein it does not have any uh, three dimensional structure it is primary single amino acid linear sequence linear sequence so this is the linear sequence of amino acid bound together by peptide bond then secondary structure when this linear sequence twist upon itself like here you can see it is twisting upon itself then it becomes secondary structure in tertiary structure the twist will be in three dimension it gives a characteristic feature this is a three dimensional features so that is three dimensional feature that is characteristic of a tertiary structure what well, advantage of three dimensional structure if it is an enzyme if there is three dimensional structure like this and there is an active center here it gives a space for the reaction to happen and substrate to bind by bringing together various other amino acid to the active center so that is the feature of tertiary sequence tertiary organization of protein and tertiary sequence is very important it's again uh, leads to if there is no proper folding of the primary sequence in a, uh, in the in the manner it is necessary that leads to loss of function loss of function and the misfolded protein will accumulate protein will accumulate leading to tissue damage example for this is amyloid proteins okay so protein folding is also important so there are diseases associated with misfolding of proteins then quaternary structure when two or more molecule like this are bound together then it becomes quaternary structure like hemoglobin if you consider an example of hemoglobin hemoglobin is made up of two alpha and two beta so these are two different chain they are brought together to form a molecule right there will be a ferrous molecule at each of this one and 2 3 dpg can bind here 
the entire molecule is hemoglobin. This is a for example of quaternary structure. So here you can see this is a primary sequence, then it is twisting upon itself, secondary and it is forming a fibril like with intramolecular chain that becomes terrestrial structure of uh, collagen. So collagen does not have quaternary structure, it does not bind to other proteins, it binds to its own uh, chain in the form of fibril. So if you consider this one as quaternary structure, it will be homo chain means it is having only its own component, it is not in, uh, it does not have any other different component. So this is a quaternary, this could be terrestrial structure and twisting upon itself will be primary uh, secondary structure if the alpha helix is the sequence forms an alpha helix. So each molecular sequence form an alpha helix and each alpha helix will go wound around itself and twist around other alpha helix to form a propocollagen which is held together by hydrogen bond. So you have to remember primary, secondary, what is primary, secondary, terrestrial, quaternary structure and you have to remember one word called denaturation. Denaturation is a process by which the nature of the protein is lost when you provide heat, nature of protein is lost and it will come back to primary structure. So denaturation does not destroy the primary structure, only it destroys the quaternary, terrestrial and secondary structure. Remember this, denaturation destroys primary, uh, quaternary, secondary and terrestrial structure, not the primary structure. So, what gives the strength and rigidity as well as flexibility for collagen molecule? Collagen molecule has strength, rigidity and flexibility. So, important thing for that to happen is cross-linking of fibril. So, together it is weak, but if you cross-link many, uh, many molecules together, it becomes strong and yet it becomes flexible. So this is happening, happens only because of hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline. So hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline are responsible for increasing the hydrogen molecule for hydrogen bond formation between the fibrils. Here you can see only when there is hydroxylysine and hydroxyproline which are modified from proline and lysine with the help of vitamin C and uh, that is due to that is affected in scurvy the, which leads to defective collagen synthesis and leads to bleeding gum which we are already spoke at length in previous class. Gum. Okay. Then comes elastin, second important molecule is elastin. Elastin is second major com uh, component of tissue and wherever the tissue which requires elasticity like in lungs, arteries which needs to expand and contract, in bladder, in skin also and then ligaments and cartilage which uh, are needed for the movement, elastin is abundantly present in that and it is composed of propoelastin, a protein primarily containing glycine, valine and modified alanine and proline residue. So elastin has glycine, valine, alanine which is modified and proline. These are the amino acid rich in elastin tissue. Elastin is also has the cross link, but that cross linking is at the sulphide, is due to sulphide molecule. Results from conversion of 
amino group of lysine to react to aldehyde by lysine oxidase so for elastin you have to remember lysine oxidases that results in spontaneous formation of desmosome cross linking so desmosome cross linking you have to remember desma zine cross link now coming to disorders of connective tissue remember marfan syndrome fibrillary gene and marfan's syndrome fibril is defect is in fibrillary gene and you have to remember lens dislocation this location upward lens this location upward in case of uh, why collagen you have to remember vitamin c scurvy cross linking vitamin c scurvy cross linking and bleeding gum bleeding gum you can see the gum which is bleeding it is because support connective tissue support is not there for new vessels tissue support is weak for new vessels new blood vessels this leads to bleeding gum it can be corrected by giving just lime or citrus fruit which contain high amount of vitamin c then one more disease you have to remember is ehlers danlos syndrome it is defect in type 3 collagen and we know that type 3 collagen are present in arteries valves joints okay then this disease will lead to problem in cardiac diseases and elastic fingers and artery wall will be damaged so it's a progressive disease and progressive deterioration happens and it's mainly affects heart valves then artery wall walls and joints this if the case contain these these three organs then it is ehlers danlos and the gene which are affected are multi multiple genes around 19 genes different variety of genes are affected they uh, send from collagen processing to folding then degradation so all varieties of uh, collagen synthesis and degradation is affected at different varying degree in different individuals so it, it is a disease of connective tissue remember type 3 collagen is affected in ehlers danlos then one more disease you have to know is osteogenic imperfecta osteogenic imperfecta brittle bone if there is a word called brittle bone it means osteogenic imperfecta here the collagen which is uh, affected will be the collagen which causes which are more in bone collagen 1 which is usually affected in brittle bone disease and this again the disease uh, the genes are multiple and it is autosomal dominant disorder and the typical feature of osteogenic imperfecta is fractures on fractures of bones on trivial fall very subtle trivial falls 
so there will be fractures they are called pathological fractures and these fractures will heal but with deformity so that will lead to permanent deformity eventually here you can see what is really happening is there is loss of triple helix that tensile strength is lost in this in the collagen which is affected in osteogenic imperfect they are not uh, winding around themselves this leads to loss of strength and this causes brittleness and fracturing upon trivial fall water soluble vitamin another important topic we should be aware of water soluble vitamin as the name suggests they are soluble in water so hence there is no hypertoxicity because it can be excreted in the kidney excreted via kidney so water soluble basically they are grouped under vitamin c and b complexes vitamin c we have talked extensively in other topic in collagen synthesis how it helps in collagen synthesis so we'll be focusing on vitamin b in this uh, video vitamin b they are complex group of uh, molecule they are put together because they are found together in the same food source except for beta cobalamin which is present in exclusively animal source and most of the vitamin b complex uh, they act together in the metabolism they are readily absorbed and not stored in the body and the dietary intake are required on regular hence the dietary intake are required for on regular basis so you have to know about the names different names which are there for b complexes like vitamin b one is called thymine this is a knowing name is very important because they might ask thiamine deficiency or they might ask b1 deficiency or b6 deficiency you should be knowing what is b6 what uh, exactly it means and where it is found then b6 is pyridoxine so there is multiple name here pyridoxine pyridoxyl pyridoxamine so they are all three active form three active form of vitamin b6 so there will be multiple names for each individual vitamins b2 is riboflavin b3 is niacin again niacin as nicotinamide and niacin nicotinic acid it could be called nicotinic acid also nicotinamide also or niacin simple niacin also that is b5 then b5 is pantothenic that is b3 then b5 is pantothenic acid b7 is biotin and folate is called b9 and b12 we all know it is cobalamin cobalamin it can exist as sine cobalamin or methyl cobalamin methyl cobalamin is present in the supplements naturally it is cyanocobalamin which is present so after knowing the uh, names of vitamin different names of vitamins so we should know what which vitamin is a cofactor for which uh, diseases and disorders so to start with biotin remember biotin for carboxylation whenever there is the name comes biotin you should know it is present for carboxylation then pantothenic acid it is present in multi enzyme complexes multi enzyme complexes pantothenic acid it helps in acyl transfer acyl transferase just remember multi enzyme for acyl transferase okay multi enzyme complex then b5 b5 a b2 that is riboflavin it is a component of redox potential that is fad nad fad 
NADFADH so riboflavin riboflavin you can go for flavin wherever there is flavin that is FAD NAD it's a coenzyme and it is also present in lipoic acid nicotinamide NAD nicotinamide is in NAD and pyridoxal phosphate is very vital enzyme pyridoxal phosphate B which is a derivative active form of vitamin B6 folic acid we already seen that folic acid with one carbon associated with one carbon metabolism that is folic acid which is tetrahydrofolate tetrahydrofolate is the active form of folic acid then thiamine thiamine phyrophosphate thiamine you remember with the help with the enzyme associate with the enzyme thiamine phyrophosphate vitamin c is also called as ascorbic acid right these are the reaction which they are involved and uh, these are the enzymes which uh, they are involved in and this is the name of the proteins uh, name of the vitamins vitamin c we don't uh, uh, I will not be dealing with it in extensively because it's already been taught in variety of other topics in collagen synthesis. So here I'll be stressing on most important thing what you have to remember with vitamin C. Vitamin C reactive oxygen species ROC because it's an antioxidant and it helps in maintaining collagen. Remember collagen and it helps in absorption of iron. So three functions, reactive oxygen, antioxidant, collagen, cross-linking, cross-linking you have to linkage and this is for case of proline and lysine that is hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine and iron absorption. Collagen synthesis you can see here because in presence of collagen, uh, vitamin C there is cross-linkage. If there is no vitamin, there is no cross linkage, and this causes weak connective tissue. This causes bleeding gum and bleeding into gum and joint spaces. You can here see here you can see periosteal hemorrhage. Periosteal hemorrhage is been seen that causes pseudo arthrosis. Pseudo arthrosis, and there will be seborrheic dermatitis also now there will be seborrheic zone which are seen with vitamin c deficiency which leads to scurvy and you can see this there there are characteristic features that is perkins spur is a characteristic the seborrheal hemorrhage is there and ring epiphysis is there these are all characteristic feature of vitamin c So this is what uh, vitamin C, D, C, E, and uh, A act in in a consecutive manner to reduce the oxidant damage. So there will be free radical formation. Uh, the free radical is been captured in sequentially, and ultimately it is glutathione, which is selenium containing um, enzyme glutathione reductase, which takes in. With the help of NADPH, this NADPH is coming from HMP shunt, that is Fentose Phosphate shunt. This two point here to remember, along with other other uh, points here. And this vitamin C rich source, orange, tomato, lemon, amla. Amla is a very good source for vitamin C, along with citrus fruit. Then coming to B7 that is biotin. Biotin you have to remember as anti egg egg white injury factor. If you take too much of egg, this leads to deficiency of biotin because egg contains avidine, means raw egg. You take raw egg that is more than twenty raw egg. Usually the muscular bodybuilders they usually take raw egg. If they take raw egg. The avidin binds with biotin and it causes deficiency 
of biotin this point you have to remember and biotin whenever there is biotin you remember carboxylation reaction so that is what you have to remember with biotin carboxylation reaction and the name b7 b7 is given for biotin and it is also produced from bacteria there is gut bacteria so broad spectrum antibiotic will lead to uh, deficiency of biotin and apart from this one what is uh, b vitamin k is also produced from gut bacteria and pantothenic acid is also produced from gut bacteria along with biotin so you just remember these three vitamins k pantothenic acid and biotin they are produced from gut bacteria metabolic role of bio biotin biotin wherever there is carboxylation reaction biotin is there pyruvate carboxylase where converts pyruvate to oxaloacetate acetyl coa which converts into methylyl coa and then propenyl coa to methyl melanyl coa there is propenyl coa carboxylation not all carboxylation reaction uses biotin but wherever most uh, most carboxylation reaction biotin is a cofactor for that for re three example which i have given they are biotin deficiency what is seen in biotin deficiency is seborrheic dermatitis this is uh, hallucination which is seen then there will be alopecia anorexia there will be alo alopecia here you can see alopecia there will be falling and there is seborrheic dermatitis the nails are there and in few condition there will be biotinidase deficiency which prevents biotin formation and they lead to atrophic optic atrophy conjunctivitis hypotonia and seizures b6 is again synthesized from intestinal b5 is synthesized this is pantothenic acid you have to remember burning foot syndrome burning foot syndrome is associated with pantothenic acid and pantothenic acid is a component of multi enzyme system which acyl transferase is its function so b6 a component of coenzyme a so we know that there is acetyl coa we have propenyl coa succinyl coa so this coa helps in transfer of uh, molecules so its pantothenic acid is component of that coa so coa is nothing but adenine adenine 3 phos 3 phosphate 5 phosphate then thioethanol amine plus pantothenic acid a combination of three molecule will produce coa wherever coa is there you know that it is pantothenic acid which is there it is a carrier of molecule like acetyl coa it carries acetyl succinyl hmg fatty acid so it's this coa carries these molecules and leads to activation of the metabolite it you have to remember burning foot syndrome for the deficiency there will be staggering gait and ataxia sleep disturbance they are usually seen in war cramps as war cramps so what happens in burning foot there will be burning and tingling sensation then thiamine you have to remember thiamine uh, that is b1 B is thiamine pyrophosphate and you have to remember beriberi thiamine is a anti beriberi factor thiamine pyrophosphate is its active form and it is involved in kinase reaction so it it, it contains pyrophosphate so it helps in phosphate transfer all of all kinase exokinase glucokinase all require thiamine in their uh, function to have proper function so it is a coenzyme for many oxidative decarboxylation reaction like pyruvate dehydrogenase keto glutarate dehydrogenase then branch chain keto dehydrogenase trans ketolase where two thiamine diphosphate also act as a cofactor in fentose phosphate pathway so hence uh, in most of the metabolic pathways wherever the multi enzyme complexes are involved uh, this thiamine the pantothenic acid b6 they are all 
play a very important role hence it is very important to have adequate level of uh, nutrition where we have adequate level of new, uh, vitamins present in them so you here you can see wherever thiamine is there phyrophosphate should uh, thiamine phyrophosphate should come to mind beriberi should come to mind and multi enzyme complex like pdh that is pyruvate dehydrogenase keto alpha ketoate dehydrogenase dehydrogenase complex should come to mind and transketolase is the one is affected in uh, thiamine deficiency which is a component of pentose phosphate and this transketolase is used activity is used to identify deficiency of thiamine deficiency of thiamine transketolase activity then what is very 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 means uh, there will be a too much pain i cannot i cannot is the literal translation of very very so it causes uh, pain throughout the body and it is seen in uh, chronic illness and it is seen in alcoholism whenever there is poor nutritional state or whenever they have this diuretic therapy infants can also have and polish raised is uh, polish raised is one the one of the condition where you can find uh, this uh, very very a deficiency of thiamine which can cause very very alcoholism can affect uh, thiamine for thiamine by interfering with absorption of thiamine alcohol directly interfere with absorption of thiamine leading to deficiency state like state so absorption of thiamine is affected leads to deficient in synthesis of thiamine so wherever alcohol is there you should know, know there is deficient in thiamine so whenever there is de in de addiction centers we we give 100 microgram of uh, thiamine high dose of thiamine normally you require around 10 you will be giving 10 times the dose uh, to prevent this uh, absorption so i cannot is the one which little translation initial stage there will be anorexia then later there will be weakness and exhaustion there will be too much exhaustion because all metabolic product uh, like um, pyruvate dehydrogenase necessary then alpha keto dehydrogenase is there all this dehydrogenase will produce uh, nadh nadh or uh, producing region and these are necessary for atp production whenever the ttp is absent your atp production will be affected and this leads to exhaustion weakness and tiredness in dry what do you mean by dry and wet wet there will be edema edema and dry there will be involvement of central nervous system there will be polyneuropathy paralysis and the patient has difficulty in raising from a squatting position this is seen it very very and it is called dry because no involvement of cardiovascular system and no edema that is the thing with uh, dry very very wet very very involvement is predominantly cardiovascular system cardiovascular system is affected and edema is prominent if cardiovascular system is affected there will be palpitation there there will be calf muscle tenderness remember whenever you have a calf muscle tenderness you are you have to think of thiamine deficiency calf muscle tenderness then there will be congestive failure that is high output congestive failure there is an infantile failure infantile beriberi because of maternal deficiency of thiamine then one more important things you have to know is uh, wernicke's encephalopathy remember wernicke's encephalopathy they are seen in alcoholic patients alcoholic uh, patients and they are central nervous system manifestation where they do confabulation confabulation means they make up story make up story stories to fill in the gap in their memory fill in gaps in memory this kind of feature is seen in alcoholism and that is called wernicke's korakoff syndrome there is loss of memory con confabulatory psychosis and in wernicke's encephalopathy along with wernicke's 
Korokoff syndrome. There will be horizontal nystagmus, ophthalmoplegia because of weakness in the extraocular muscle, ataxia and mental impairment. This all together is called Wernicke's encephalopathy. To detect, you go can go for thymine level by HPLC or you can go for transketolase, RBC's transketolase activity. Transketolase activity. You can go for RBC transketolase activity to estimate the, if, whether there is a thymine deficiency or not. Then coming to riboflavin. Riboflavin is a component of FMN and FAD. So this is a component for FADH and NADH that enters the electron transport chain by complex 2. And it also is necessary for production of ATP. So it's a prosthetic group of flavoprotein enzymes. Flavo group of enzyme other uh, riboflavin is necessary for it. The role of FAD and AD, FAD dependent enzyme, FMN dependent, they are FMN dependent where FMN is necessary. That is NADA dehydrogenase, oxidases. FAD requiring is succinate dehydrogenase, xanthine oxidase, pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Most of the dehydrogenase where uh, uh, TTP is also necessary, FA, uh, riboflavin is also necessary for that function. Microsomal hydroxylase system and mitochondrial glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase. Most of the dehydrogenase and oxidases are involved in riboflavin uh, metabolism. Riboflavin acts, helps in those enzymes. Deficiency usually it uh, it's overlaps with the deficiency of thymine. That is seen in alcoholism, malabsorption syndromes, prolonged anorexia, and there is a transient deficiency in phototherapy for infants uh, where this is there seen. Symptoms, uh, it's, it causes kilosis. The symptoms and signs are more, uh, riboflavin are more confirmed with the skin and mucosa. You can see there is... Uh, Angular vascularization, that is corneal vascularization. There is a classical magenta tongue, red magenta tongue. You can see red magenta tongue here. There is angular stomatitis. You can see angular stomatitis. And there will be seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis, most, uh, mostly related to skin and mucous membrane. Characteristic magenta tongue. Machenta tongue is seen with B2, that is riboflavin deficiency. Assessment, assessment is by glutathione reductase, that is riboflavin independent enzyme. Or you can go for um, diagnosis, uh, pinpointing diagnosis is difficult rather than treating. Treating is very easy whenever there is a skin deformity, skin angular stomatitis or uh, corneal vasculation. Uh, straight away you give riboflavin in those cases. Niacin that is B6, it is pellagra. We already seen uh, pellagra like uh, symptoms in when we were discussing tryptophan. So remember niacin, pellagra. Tryptophan and NAD, NAD, NADP. So this is about niacin, which is present in, uh, which is necessary for NAD, NADH reaction. We know that NADH uh, is necessary for production of ATP and NADPH is necessary for cholesterol biosynthesis, fatty acid biosynthesis and react to oxygen species. ADP riboxylation, NAD act as a ADP ribose. So these are the enzymes which are NAD dependent, glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha keto again all dehydrogenase are related to NAD, FAD as well as uh, thymine phyrophosphate, lactate dehydrogenase and then glu glucose dehydrogenase, beta hydroxy acyl CoA dehydrogenase. NADP dependent reaction, G6PD, malic enzymes, glutamate dehydrogenase, isocitrate, uh, cytosolic isocitrate dehydrogenase. 
these are NADP they will be producing NADPH so whereas NADPH is required for all synthesis then uh, which is required for HMG CoA reductase then dihydrofolate reductase and phenylalanine hydroxylase NADPH related de novo synthesis I already told it is produced from the uh, tryptophan and via chylurin chylurinase will be uh, produced whenever this pathway is affected and requires B6 also and it's produced about 50% uh, of the body requirement come from tryptophan source meat is a good source for uh, you know, the tryptophan and tryptophan will be converted to niacin so hence uh, niacin uh, will be obtained from meat then bread white bread then peanuts mushrooms will be the good source and fish will be fish will be good source for uh, B of to obtain niacin and pellagra uh, we know that pyridoxyl B6 is necessary for the production of niacin tryptophan and B6 deficiency heart nerve disease, disease carcinoid syndrome again carcinoid is the serotonin producing tumor and tryptophan is used up whenever there is uh, uh, increase uh, in whenever there is a carcinoid syndrome and tryptophan deficiency will be there maize uh, diet niacin is not observed and it is not available as present in not uh, unavailable form in maize deficiency sogram that is johar we have seen i leucine leucine will lead to interfere with the conversion of quinylate to niacin that leads to deficiency of uh, niacin and tuberculosis and isoniazide whenever there is a TB treatment with isoniazide this leads to pyridoxine inactivation so INH treatment B6 will be affected B6 is affected that causes pyridoxine that causes niacin deficiency that leads to pellagra pellagra the you have to remember 5 D's here there is 3 D the fourth D is death so dermatitis, dry azematous scaly skins, then there will be diarrhea, blood vessels, blood in uh, mucosa will be there in diarrhea and derm dementia will be there long standing cases, there will be memory loss. A typical feature of uh, pellagra is castle neck, necklace like castle necklace, a ring around neck, so you can see the ring, ring formation around the neck, that is castle neck is typical feature of Pellagra. So therapeutic use, uh, there is one therapeutic use for uh, niacin also. Niacin increases HDL, which is uh, which is also called good cholesterol. So it has a therapeutic use uh, apart from uh, its nutritive value. It is given in treatment of hyperlipidemia. It inhibits hormone sensitive lipase. And this hormone sensitive lipase will inhibit free fatty acid formation and lowers plasma cholesterol as well as LDL cholesterol and triglyceride. Large dose leads to flushing and hypoglycemia and hepatic toxicity. You should be aware of that. And for the treatment of pellagra, it is usually given in a dose of 100 to 200. We'll be talking about uh, fat soluble vitamins. Vitamins are very important. Uh, topics to be covered and to be learned and understand in a proper way for you people to answer neat exams and we'll be talking about fat soluble vitamins today fat soluble vitamins they are ADEK ADEK are the fat soluble vitamins and uh, in that first I will brief the vitamins first and we'll then we'll talk about uh, them in detail what you have to learn about fat soluble vitamin and water soluble vitamin is Fat soluble vitamin requires fat and the um, lipid digestion and absorption in the body to be adequate for them to be absorbed into the system. And being a fat soluble, they can be stored in our body. So with these two points, we'll go with fat soluble vitamin means it can be stored 
and it requires lipid digestion to be normal. If there is any abnormality with lipid digestion, it leads to fat soluble vitamin deficiency. What are the abnormalities you can see in lipid digestion? Lipid digestion. One, bile salt, inadequate bile salts. So bile salts are required for miscellaneous formation. If inadequate bile salt is there, if the liver function is not proper, liver uh, dysfunction is there, that leads to inadequate bile salt or when there is conjugation defect, that leads to defective bile salt or when there is any intestinal problem which leads to defective and enterohepatic recirculation of bile salt and hepatic circulation that also leads to defect in fat malabsorption or whenever there is an in pancreatic insufficiency pancreatic insufficiency will lead to defective lipase formation lipase is necessary for fat breaking down or whenever there is intestinal wall abnormality intestinal wall that leads to inadequate malabsorption of fat and this lead to inadequate uh, even fat soluble vitamin absorption. So this point you have to remember uh, wherever there is lipid digestion and absorption problem that also le indirectly leads to fat malabsorption or fat, fatty, uh, fat soluble vitamin deficiency in our body. Then it can be stored in lipid uh, adipose tissue. This has an advantage and disadvantage. Whereas water soluble vitamins should be taken in a constant amount uh, in diet usually in all diet uh, which we take fat soluble vitamin can be stored for up to two years uh, like in one example is vitamin b12 vitamin b12 stays for up to two years the stores but similarly if we take too much hyper is seen in only fat soluble vitamin the two a and d there are hyper vitaminosis disorders are which are seen in vitamins those are a and d only in d if there is hypervitaminosis you know that the function of uh, vitamin d calcium absorption and this causes deposition of calcium stone in the connective tissue and is in the kidneys also these are the uh, drawbacks of being uh, able to store in our body so coming to vitamin a vitamin a you have to remember retinol you have to remember retinol and retinoic acid so retinol is all related to reproductive function wherever reproductive function is there that is germinal cell uh, epithelial maintenance retinol is used retinol is used for is used for vision all trans retinol cis retinol that valve cycle it is called valved cycle in valve cycle the retinol is used retinoic acid is used for epithelial health so all epithelial cell health or epithelial health we use retinol so this retinol retinol and retinoic acid together constitute active form of vitamin active form of vitamin A okay so what is beta carotene beta carotene is a component of uh, diet more rich in, in 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 carrot and beta carotene can give two molecule of retinol two molecule of retinol can be obtained by beta carotene right and it can be stored to some extent vitamin d it's already we have talked about vitamin d it is sunshine vitamin sunshine vitamin and it can be obtained from fish milk cereals cheese butter whole grain and from sunshine how it is produced 7 dehydroxy cholesterol an exposure to skin it cyclizes uh, to colocalciferol colocalciferol ferrol and in liver on the action of 25 hydroxylase it is converted to 25 hydroxy colocalciferol and in kidney it is uh, 
with the help of one alpha hydroxylase it kind of it becomes active form that is calcitriol which is nothing but vitamin d3 vitamin d3 is the active form vitamin d3 active form so this is uh, the pictorial representation once 125 hydroxy colocalciferol is formed it acts by binding to vitamin d binding protein and it travels in the skin uh, in the blood in the blood it is transported by vitamin d binding protein and in the tissues it enters the cell it has an intracellular receptor because it becomes it is a product of steroid that is cholesterol and it goes and activates the gene responsible for for production of cal binding remember this and this increases calcium and phosphorus that is a function of this one and the vitamin d has a role in immune system you have to remember those things orally told the absorption pro vitamin ergosterol and colocalciferol can be enter into circulation and they are carried by chylomicrons chylomicrons are the one which carries lipids from the diet intestine to peripheral organ and half life is 2 to 3 weeks then how vitamin d is regulated vitamin d can be regulated by stimulating alpha 1 hydroxylase at the liver it can be regulated by regulating cholesterol and it can be regulated by 25 hydroxylase in the liver controlled by feedback by 25 hydroxylase then alpha 1 alpha hydroxylase and whenever there is hypocalcemia and hypophosphatemia or pth is there this enzyme is stimulated so low calcium low phosphate and high pth stimulates alpha 1 hydroxylase and thereby increases the production of vitamin d3 functions immune we already discussed in detail in our previous classes like it has a function on immune system it as function on bone main function is on the bone that is calcium homeostasis it uh, increases osteoclastic activity it increases the calcium and phosphate mineralization and it increases in the intestine it increases cal binding cal binding is the protein which uh, increases the calcium absorption and increases calcium absorption and thereby increases the plasma calcium level and also it regulates epidermal proliferation of skin immune system and uh, proliferation and many uh, vitamin d is also known to have anti cancer in recent time it is known to have anti viral also with respect to sars cov anti viral effect replication it is blocking replication it is blocking replication by having anti proliferative effect and immune differentiation also it is produced via cytokine production that is also helping in uh, it boosting the immune uh, mechanism and it also increases the insulin sensitivity these are the other function of vitamin d main function is bone and immune system other functions are anti proliferative anti cancer agent point to remember with consider with vitamin d is it is an anti rickettic factor remember anti rickettic factor it prevents rickets it's a sunshine vitamins and exposure to uv b is important uvb is the one which is gives the ma maximum advantage daily recommendation is 100 uh, 400 international unit in india it is 5 uh, microgram that is 200 international unit per day and there is toxicity if you take more than 10 to 100 times the recommended daily allowance what are the symptoms there will be anorexia hypercalcemia hypercalciuria thirst then muscular weakness then calcium deposit in the kidney calcification of the other soft tissue organs calcification of the 
soft tissue organ and there will be because of hypercalcemia there will be ecg changes then vitamin k we know that vitamin k is for coagulation k is for coagulation it increases the carbon dioxide binding to glutamate residue this causes glutamate residue of glutamate amino acid in clotting factors clotting factors hence it helps in binding increases the negative charge helps in binding carbon calcium this causes activation the binding of calcium causes activation of clotting system and vitamin k is produced from bacteria bacteria right so the vitamin k dependent factors you have to remember is 2 7 9 10 remember 2 7 9 10 and protein s and c these two are also vitamin k dependent clotting factors then you have to remember one point uh, the gut flora if there is a deterioration of gut flora by chronic antibody use then your vitamin k production is also decreased clotting factors you know there is an intrinsic factor and extrinsic factor the clotting factor affected by vitamin k is 2 4 2 7 9 10 so it affects both the pathway 2 7 9 10 it affects both the pathway both extrinsic and intrinsic 2 7 9 10 so 2 is also affected 5 is also affected 7 is also affected and 9 is also affected so it affects both intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway vitamin k source spinach very good source bacteria it can be produced broccoli is again very good source uh, along with meat and fish oil so which of the following enzyme or vitamins is unable to protect against free radical damage now we are uh, going for free radical damage so what are the vitamins which causes free radical damage uh, prevents free radical damage we know that vitamin a vitamin c vitamin e are known to have antioxidant capacity known to have antioxidant capacity so we'll see vitamin a is represented here by beta carotene beta carotene then where is c vitamin c vitamin e so we have all these antioxidant and you we know that it is glutathione peroxidase is necessary for preventing reactive oxygen species by help of glutathione then superoxide dismutase is the first enzyme which helps in degradation of hydrogen peroxide superoxide dismutase is necessary for neutralizing hydrogen peroxide so the enzyme which is left which is not involved with free radical is B6. Here you can see there is reactive oxygen species which is happening. There is exposure to environmental exposure or UV light or the other condition or metabolic. There is increase of free radicals. Free radicals. This attacks the lipid layer by layer. Lipid by layers of the cell membrane and this causes cell membrane damage and this causes the chain reaction of reactive oxygen species there is there are free radicals so if the free radicals are allowed it keeps on multiplying effect so it has to be the chain has to be broken the chain need to be broken that chain breaking happens with vitamin c vitamin a and vitamin e in the process they minimizes the free radical production so once the free radical provides elemental free elemental iron to vitamin e 
vitamin e becomes radical it becomes radicalized here so this radical but the vitamin e radical is less harmful to the body compared to the uh, lipoprotein radicals which are lipid free radicals or oxygen free radical which are developed so but it need to be regenerated what it does it gives its radical to vitamin c and it becomes radicalized uh, vitamin c and the vitamin c again it gives to thiol cycle which contain glutathione and dihydro dihydrolipid enzymes and other thyroidoxin they are all antioxidant and it is also de uh, regenerated then ultimately the nadph comes and it regenerates this molecules for the next cycle of reactive oxygen species neutralization this is how vitamin e c a along with glutathione and superoxide peroxide act as an antioxidant system so coming to vitamin e it is natural antioxidant and uh, its uh, chemical name is tocopherol and tocotrienols are there because it has a tocol ring this is the tocol ring you don't have to worry about that they are polyisoprenoid rings with methyl groups it is fat soluble it is fat soluble and degraded by freezing and cooking at high temperature and food processing just remember that so three step of the pathway malabsorption again absorption is there if there is calomicron secretion defect it can lead to deficiency or defect in vldl secretion uh, anything related to lipid absorption then vitamin a uh, so we have uh, briefly we have seen vitamin a in detail we'll be seeing what is the function of vitamin a vitamin a retinol retinoids together they are three active form retinol retinyl and retinoic acid in uh, under carotenoid they are alpha beta and gamma carotenoids they can beta carotene uh, comes under it animal source of vitamin is retinol which is esterified form and vitamin a can be stored in the liver so liver of an enzyme is good animals are good source for vitamin plant source yellow color and dark colored fruits and vegetables and bright color basically bright color fruits they are very good a source for vitamin a like papaya carrots and mango polished uh, rice cereals are poor source that you have to remember functions vision growth reproduction and oxidant are the function this is called wald cycle remember that wald cycle is cis to all trans retinol there is cycling between the cis and all trans retinol is wald cycle here you can see when light falls on rhodopsin rhodopsin is made up of opsin and cis 11 cis 11 cis retinol so when the light falls on the levensis retinol it becomes bathorhodopsin lumirhodopsin metarhodopsin and opsin ultimately rhodopsin is removed and opsin is formed in the process what is happening is levensis is converted to in the process levensis is converted to all trans retinol cis levin cis is converted to all trans that is upon falling of light so it need to be regenerated to levin cis that cycle is called wald cycle right regeneration of levin cis retinol to all trans retinol via retinol isomerase our levin cis is converted to all trans is called cis uh, wald cycle and uh, falling of light and conversion of levin to all trans retinol will induce a message by gtp mediated message which causes hyperpolarization of rod and this causes release of neurotransmitter and activation of neurotransmitter that is how vision is seen so 
in uh, brief when light falls on rhodopsin energy of light isomerizes 11 to all to 11 trans isomerization lead to straightening of the side chain of retinal pulling the opsin this causes conformational change in rhodopsin that leads to production of meta rhodopsin and this activates the g protein as transducin and it activates phosphodiesterase enzyme converting phosph cyclic gmp to 5 prime gmp this brings the concentration of cyclic gmp in the rod this causes keeps the sodium channel of the membrane open, open state allowing sodium to depolarize this sodium channel closes then leads to hyperpolarization of the rod in the membrane in hyperpolarized state the voltage gated calcium channel are opened so sodium channel closes leads to hyperpolarization hyperpolarization opens voltage gated calcium channels and these leads to less intracellular calcium cellular calcium and less intracellular calcium lead to decrease glutamate release at the neural releasing neurotransmitter in bipolar cell lead to activation of optic nerve so you need not know in detail about the valve cycle but you should be aware what is the um, secondary mediator that is cyclic gmp in this case and everywhere it is hyperpolarization depolarization which triggers here it is hyperpolarization which triggers the nerve or uh, triggers the signals nerve signals deficiency first symptom of uh, vitamin a deficiency is green color adaptation night blindness night blindness we'll see night blindness xerophthalmia keratomalacia that is the cornea becomes soft thinned out and there will be scarring these are seen with the skin it is frog and thin uh, todd skin that hyperkeratosis is seen with vitamin d deficiency uh, is vitamin d is also affected with severe vitamin a deficiency so what you have to remember is night blindness classical xerophthalmia keratomalacia todd skin then also vitamin d and thyroid function is affected immune system is affected so the treatment is give 1000 international unit in oil is recommended for infant at 6 months of age and then 2000 every 6 months till they reach 6 years in who staging they have given some staging you need not worry about that but remember the first symptoms will be night blindness first symptoms will be the night blindness that is nyctalopia is the earliest symptom then comes the dryness of uh, eye. then comes the bite out spot that is triangular white spot in the conjunctiva on, uh, on the cornea then xerosis keratomalacia liquefaction of the cornea ulcers scarring and xerophthalmic fundus they are the later stage uh, will be we see bite out spot is again important along with night blindness that finishes the fat soluble vitamin thank you in this video we will be talking about high yielding uh, topics and in biochemistry with regard to your lead pg fats it is very important uh, to have a crisp revision of the to those topics which are bound to come in the exam and it is very much necessary for your understanding because they are all concept based. So fact based questions you can easily learn and then concept based questions you require little guidance. So that's why we have put together few topics which are high yielding and require some concept, concepts and explanation. So coming to first uh, high yielding is vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important molecule, vitamin, uh, with regard to your clinical health also and for 
uh, for the MCQ point of view also. Vitamin D is also called sunshine vitamin. All know what the sunshine vitamin means. Means it can be produced with the help of sun light. Okay, it can be produced with the help of sunlight. Simple, straightforward. Now comes the question. Which sunlight? Infrared rays, UV rays, normal light, and in UV rays, which UV rays? So, the sunlight which is necessary is UV light and D. UV D is the most important one, and the UV D is usually present in early morning hours. So, early morning walking with sleeveless dress. Uh, will expose your body to the sunlight and this will help in production of vitamin D. Now, how does a sunlight help in production of vitamin D? For that, you should have in your body what is known as cholesterol. Right? Strange, the cholesterol is important for the production of vitamin D. And what type of cholesterol? 7 D hydroxy cholesterol which is produced from the liver a derivative of cholesterol 7 d hydroxy cholesterol once this 7 d hydroxy cholesterol comes in the dermis and with the exposure of light this 7 d hydroxy cholesterol converts itself into a molecule called calcitriol right calci triol by series of reactions. First it will become pre-vitamin D3 then it is transported to the liver where there is formation of a molecular bond at 25th position 25th dihydroxy colocalciferol then that molecule goes to the kidney and there formation of a 125 d for all, which is the active form of vitamin D called calcitriol. So, the pathway here is cholesterol forms D. 7 dihydroxy cholesterol then this forms colocalciferol colocalciferol it is nothing but pre vitamin d 3 this goes to the liver form 25 dihydroxy colocalciferol colocalciferol and it goes to the kidney to form 125 dihydroxy colocalciferol. This is nothing but active form of vitamin called calcitriol. Calcitriol. So you have to remember skin, liver, and kidney. This much organs are involved in the formation of vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is the active form of vitamin. Now, once vitamin is formed, what is its function? Like where, where, where it is used and what it does? So, we will erase this. Then, Main function of vitamin D is bone, calcium, metabolism. So, to have an healthy bone, calcium, we require adequate amount of calcium. So, vitamin D ensure adequate amount of calcium by way of intestinal absorption absorption 
kidney reabsorption then remodeling in bone releasing calcium releasing calcium this is the function of vitamin d to ensure homeostasis of calcium then the secondary function of vitamin d is in immune system recently you, know, you all know in covid 19 all the doctors prescribes vitamin d this is known to help boost up the immune system boost immune system as well as few unreported investigation showed it blocks replication of SARS-CoV-2 SARS-CoV-2 so hence vitamin D is necessary for immune cell also necessary for liver cell healthy liver cell and bone vitamin D is also propagated as an having an anti cancer effect so for all for your point of view vitamin D bone and immune cell are important then vitamin D is degraded by forming 2425 dihydroxy colocalciferol this is the degradation product of degradation product degraded degraded vitamin d is degraded by altering the position of the hydrogen hydroxy group at 24 to 25 so with this background we will try to analyze few of the important aspect of vitamin d in kidney disorder we are known to have bone related problem kidney disorders leads to bone related problem and we are seen we have seen in chronic kidney renal failure see in chronic renal failures we have increase ppa we, we know that the ppa is related to phosphate and calcium metabolism so why does uh, this happen this happens because the enzyme which is necessary for the activation of vitamin d 125 1hydroxy colocalciferol is present in kidney so that the 25 dihydroxy colocalciferol becomes an active form of vitamin d without an active form of vitamin d vitamin d does not function properly and there is bone demineralization and calcium homeostasis is affected with calcium homeostasis phosphate homeostasis is also affected hence the increase in pth and bone deformity is associated with chronic renal failure so vitamin d is not only sourced from sunlight it can be given from diet also diet which are rich in vitamin d are fish dairy and fortified food now the food is being fortified with vitamin d to supplement lack of exposure in western countries and in uh, arctic regions there is less amount of sunlight so in those region vitamin d is given fortified along with the food this about vitamin d one molecule you have to remember is called cal binding cal binding cal binding is a protein receptor to absorb absorb calcium in intestine and kidney
right so cal binding cal binding protein is released stimulated the gene for cal binding is being stimulated by vitamin d so that more and more of cal binding are produced so and calcium is absorbed so that's how vitamin d increases the calcium absorption and also it activates a group of cytochrome chromes cytochrome 24 a1 and cytochrome 24 b1 to inhibit its own absorption so once it is uh, to cytochrome 24 b1 which is an enzyme which is responsible for conversion of 24 to 125 dihydroxychloroquinol is there to increase the amount of calcium can be reabsorbed from the intestine and it also act to inactivate itself by activating cytochrome 24a1 so 24a1 will cause formation of 24 25 dihydroxychloroquinol that is an inactive form then one more point here to remember with uh, vitamin d is it has a nuclear receptor being a sterol it can travel across the lipid bilayer and it can bind to a receptor vitamin d receptor which is inside the cell so by crossing via surface receptor it can go into the cell and then it, through that genes it can activate the genes which are responsible for calcium absorption so the nanometer you have to if they are they have not given vitamin b uh u uvb but they are given the frequency of the light it is 290 to 320 nanometer is the frequency of the uv light which is which will trigger formation of vitamin d so it will be converting the pro vitamin to pre vitamin there is polycalciferol and the active form is vitamin d3 from cholesterol remember the word cholesterol is necessary for vitamin d formation and dietary intake fish is the source for dietary fish and mushroom then most of the vitamin d metabolism intracellular function is a vast area so you need not go through the entire thing just focus on what i have told kidney defect will also cause vitamin deficiency or vitamin d deficiency related this one uh, by way of uh, inactivating or defective activation of vitamin d uvb you have to remember it has a nuclear receptor you have to remember and the source of vitamin plant animal source and plant source you have to remember and if you want if you can remember cytochromes 24a and 27b that would be fine so those are the cytochromes which increases the enzyme and increases the formation of calcitriol here you can see a dose less will uh, calcitriol in the body will have a negative feedback inhibition on cytochrome of uh, 24a1 which decreases the degradation of vitamin d and has a positive impact on 27b1 which increases 124 dihydroxychloroquinol or activation of calcifolate uh, cal activation of uh, vitamin d the other one other important uh, high yield topic is tumor markers tumor markers you know they are also called as tumor biomarkers you know these are the these are used for screening as well as diagnostic as well as prognostic marker to find out whether the cancer particular cancer is uh, is present or not like the example which is given here 
that is CA125. CA125 is a marker for ovarian cancer, but it is not an exclusive marker for ovarian cancer. It is expressed in other benign condition also, but it can be used as a screening test. Similarly, prostate antigen specific is a marker of prostate cancer. We have HCG, which is marker of Korean choreo carcinoma. We have CA19.9, which is a marker of uh, uh, adnexal mass and uh, carcinomatosis. Hepatobiliary diseases, pancreatitis, so it is marker for many uh, conditions. Then we have uh, this triple marker for uh, breast cancer, which are uh, estrogen receptors, HER receptors, and other markers. Then alpha fetoprotein is a marker for hepatocellular carcinoma. It's a very good marker for hepatocellular carcinoma. And this germanoma, germ cell that is alpha fetoprotein because alpha fetoprotein is an embryonic protein. It gets reactivated when there is dedifferentiation. Dedifferentiation happens when the tumor uh, goes when when the cell is dysregulated and it, it goes for deregulation. And once the cell goes for deregulation, it dedifferentiate and other primitive proteins or the embryonic proteins are uh, started to express similarly like alpha beta protein which is not uh, normally present in adults. Testosterone can be a lady cell marker, there is a germ cell mutation or granulosal cell mutation. Uh, you can have this testosterone and mullerian hormones where can be seen. Choreo embryonic antigen which is CEA is seen in colon cancer. So this uh, biomarkers, one or two, one one or two question they might ask uh, regarding these biomarkers. They will give a, a marker and ask which organ, uh, which cancer it is usually present. Like CA one twenty five. If they ask, it is all uh, related to ovarian cancer. So you should be aware of those uh, prostate uh, specific antigen PSA. Prostate specific antigen is for prostate and HCG is for courier carcinoma. At least few of the things you should be familiar so that if the question is asked, you will be able to at least exclude and write the correct answer. This is a graph uh, showing different organs and the tumor markers which they expect. Like we'll start with the liver, liver as alpha fetoprotein, CEA and ferritin. Ferritin can be used as a liver cell markers, carcinoma of the liver cell. And gastrointestinal GI tract, you have CEA which is most commonly used and we have 19.19 can be used for pancreas as well as for gastrointestinal. For ovary, CA125 is most commonly used uh, along with alpha fetoprotein and CA15. For colon, CEA is very important and uh, BRAF, BRAF is used nowadays. For testers, alpha fetoprotein and human chorionic gonadotrophin. Melanin, this is most common and uh, most specific markers that is S100. S100 is used for melanin, melanoma. Uh, for bladder carcinoma, then LMP is used. Carcinoid syndrome, this is uh, again a uh, specific 5-HA, 5-indole acetic acid is more common one uh, which is used for uh, diagnosing of carcinoid syndrome. For lung, there is multiple enzyme NS. NSC is used small cell carcinoma for small cell carcinomas, then CA can also be used and for bone you have osteocalcin which is most common used uh, marker for the bone but uh, the uh, clinical features can be used to diagnose and ready along with the radiological feature for the bone which is not a problem with the uh, 
solid tumors, uh, this bone related cancers. But a soft tissue tumor is very difficult to diagnose in the initial stage when using radiographic markers. So, biomarker comes handy in those uh, solid tumor. With thyroid, thyroglobulin can be used, calcitonin can be used for uh, diagnosis. As I said, the breast cancer, uh, her, her two new is more commonly used along with uh, the histogen receptors for uh, as a marker of triple triple positive and triple negative carcinomas. Now uh, coming to Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a mineral uh, disease associated with copper. Remember the word copper for Wilson's. Remember KF ring for Wilson. KF Fisher ring, characteristic ring in the cornea and remember Deposition of uh, copper in liver causes liver failure and hepatomegaly. There is CNS disorder and cardiomyopathy is also there and arthritis is also there. So, most important thing is air fissure ring, hepatomegaly and copper with Wilson's disease. So, what happens in Wilson's disease? The power, the, the, uh, the metabolic defect is in transport protein. That is ATP, ATP 7B gene which is affected in Wilson's disease. This leads to decreased copper excretion into bile and decreased copper binding into ceruloplasma. Ceruloplasmin. These two features are seen with ATP ATP seven beta beta gene in chromosome twelve. They both together will increase free copper, and free copper get deposited in brain, in cornea. In brain, it causes neurological symptoms, neurological symptoms, disorders. In cornea, it causes KF ring and in liver, it causes cirrhosis and in blood, it causes hemolysis. So, these are the features of Wilson's disease. So, it, you have to remember A. TP7 beta gene which helps in excretion of copper into the bile and binding of copper into the ceruloplasm which ultimately leads to increased copper excretion and causes damage. So, in next class we will go through lipoproteinemias, hyperlipidemias, tangiers disease all those associated with beta oxidation and other inborn errors associated with lipids and organic acid urea. Then uh, we will be discussing on carnitine shuttle. It is a very small discussion of carnitine shuttle. Just you, you want to know what it is all about because it will be there in the choice along with uh, malate shuttle or aspartate shuttle or it could be a core cycle or something like that. This carnitine shuttle is for used for transporting long chain fatty acid into the mitochondria matrix. So, there is beta oxidation, the long chain fatty acid need to be oxidized to release energy, it needs to enter into the mitochondrial matrix. So, for that the long chain fatty acid cannot cross the mitochondrial membrane, hence it need to be carried and that carrier shuttle is called carnitine shuttle. Carnitine shuttle and carnitine molecule will carry fatty acid, uh, fatty acid from the long chain fatty acid and uh, it is carried into the cell and inside the cell it again forms and the long chain fatty acyl CoA liberating carnitine molecule. So, the carnitine can come out 
and can uh, undergo a second cycle. Here you can see a long chain fatty acid is bind, uh, is converted into fatty acyl CoA using a acyl CoA synthetase, and then uh, CPT1, which is a carrier of uh, carnitine, will be taking fatty acyl carnitine into inside the cell. Inside the cell, the fatty acyl carnitine is again broken down into carnitine and fatty acyl by using CPT2. CPT2 is inside the cell, and carnitine again comes back. Uh, to the inner mitochondrial space for another round of uh, carrying of free of long chain fatty acid and here we use carnitine acyl translocase in the inner mitochondrial membrane for the transport of carnitine into the cell then again the core cycle you should know what is core cycle core cycle relates to lactate it is glucose lactate cycle. Cori cycle is glucose lactate cycle. Don't get confused with glucose alanine cycle. Glucose alanine cycle, which is very much similar to glucose lactate cycle. Here you can see in the muzzle, the lactate is produced in the metabolic. Uh, the product of glycolysis and too much of lactate if it is there need to be removed from the system to avoid acid base imbalance and it will be taken from to the liver where in liver lactate is converted back to pyruvate and from pyruvate it is converted to glucose and glucose is liberated this cycle is called Cori cycle or glucose lactate cycle and similarly, there is uh, transport of uh, alanine to produce glucose in the liver, that is glucose alanine cycle. This is an example for gluconeogenesis. And a few case discussion related to gluconeogenesis. An obese patient volunteered to go on a starvation diet as a part of study of amino acid metabolism. Blood samples were taken and analyzed for plasma amino acid for as long as three weeks following the fast. Valine, isoleucine, and uh, leucine, methionine, and amino butyrate concentration were transiently increased during the first week of life, uh, first week of fasting but dropped below the initial level later glycine threonine serine level decreased more slowly whereas 13 other amino acid individuals eventually decreased decrease was largest for alanine what is the reason for largest decrease of alanine basically this is a question related to prolonged starvation prolonged starvation where all amino acid are in, uh, decreased and then eventually uh, initially increased because they are there is a muscle wasting there and eventually they will be decreasing as the starvation continues. Alanine there is increased because of glucose alanine cycle I told uh, it is used it could be used for glucose production. So branch chain Stimulate the production of both alanine in the muscle related to gluconeogenesis consumed in, in the product of other non essential amino acid. So, increase in alanine is seen during fasting. There is increase, largest increase in alanine, then followed by decrease. They are all related to gluconeogenesis. Then, one more inborn error is glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. G6PD. G6PD deficiency is related to oxidant antioxidant oxidant antioxidant pathway. Antioxidant pathway. So what happens in uh, oxidant antioxidant pathway is 
this pathway is active only when there is enough of glutathione function glutathione function is adequate only when there is adequate nadph availability nadph is available only when hmp shunt is active hmp shunt other name is pentose pentose phosphate pathway pentose phosphate pathway or ppep pathway so pentose phosphate pathway starts with molecule called glucose 6 phosphate this leads to production of two molecule of nadph so glucose 6 phosphate is converted to glucose 6 glucose phosphogluconolactone and 6 phosphogluconolactone It will be converted to phosphogluconolactone and liberating another molecule of NADPH. So we will be having two NADPH, and this NADPH is necessary for uh, glutathione to be reduced. So by with the help of glutathione reductase, and glutathione reductase will go on to neutralize hydrogen peroxide. these are peroxides or free radicals oxygen free radicals in the cell and neutralizing them again the for this glucose reduce oxidized glutathione has to be regenerated so that will happens only with the help of nadp so basically what is the pathology associated with g6pd g6pd if they give case it will be associated like they will give uh, there is malarial drug and this causes uh, their patient is taking malarial drug and this causes uh, hemolysis of the uh, hemolytic anemia features will be there and there will be hemolysis feature and bilirubin is increased all kind of that kind of feature they will give so why uh, it is associated with malarial drug is rbcs are prone for damage during malarial disorders and they need to be uh, the free radicals need to be tackled so the demand for uh, g6pd means demand for nadh nadph increases during malarial episode and they will be screened for uh, inadequate response to the treatment or there will be increased hemolytic uh, disorders associated with uh, this condition so in those uh, condition when we analyze g6pd in fibroblast or uh, in leukocyte we will be observing a decrease level of g6pd in them this leads to increase this add on to the increased destruction of rbcs and lead to anemia like symptoms in patients with malaria so it's an excellent recessive inheritance you have to know g6pd is excellent recessive that means all males will be affected and the screening test used for this thing is called brain screen method remember the method name brain screen it is nothing but a nitroprusside is given and this will convert the blood into cherry red and eventually with the addition of methylene blue it will be converting back to dark red in normal it takes uh, 32 to 1 hours in g6pd deficiency it takes more than 2 hours because there is lesser amount of nadph so a simple screening method to know g6pd deficiency just remember the name brain stain method